Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Steph Kershaw, who's from the University of Sydney, where she's a research fellow, and she's a project manager of Cracks in the Ice, and she's going to have a chat with us today about understanding methamphetamine. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which we're meeting today and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that welcome and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us in the room or indeed on webinar land. So welcome and thank you. And without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Steph Kershaw to the platform. Thank you. Great, so good morning everyone. Um, and thank you for having me along today. So I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the voice of lived experience, which guides me and everything we do in our project. So as Jim mentioned, I will be talking about uh, the cracks in the ice portal. Um, and this provides evidence-based information and resources about crystal methamphetamine to the Australian community. So I'm going to talk a little bit about crystal methamphetamine in Australia. I am aware you've had two methamphetamine presentations previously, so I will try not to be too repetitive, um, but it's really just to set the scene to talk then more about cracks in the ice and some exciting new research that we did on attitudes and barriers to care for people who use uh, crystal methamphetamine. So as I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here, uh, methamphetamine is a stimulant and that means that it accelerates the activity of the central nervous system and it also triggers the release of the neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin and noradrenaline which make people feel alert and excited. But it's important to realise that methamphetamine is not a new drug. It's been around for many, many years um, but it's just been the last decade or so we've seen an increase in its public profile. Now methamphetamine comes in three forms, crystal or ice, base and speed. And the difference um, between these forms are their purity and potency, with crystal being often the more pure compared to the other variants. Because it is generally more potent, it gives the user a stronger and longer lasting feeling of euphoria, but can also increase the risk of side effects. Now, not everyone who uses methamphetamine experiences negative side effects um, as they depend on the route of administration, the person who's taking the drug, um, what other drugs they might be using at the same time, and also how frequently they're taking it. But with crystal methamphetamine, because it is that bit more pure, there is that greater potential for them to have those more severe um, side effects, particularly if they use it for a long time in increasing amounts. When we look at how many people use uh, methamphetamine in Australia, we can see that relatively few people report using it compared to other drugs. And this is according to the results of the latest National Drug Strategy Household Survey. And that's the largest population survey in Australia. Um, and this collects information about alcohol and other drug use. So as you can see, there was 1.4% of Australians reported using methamphetamine, and that's any type, with one, less than 1% reporting using ice specifically, and that compared to 3% for cocaine, another stimulant, 10% for cannabis, and 77% for alcohol. And when you look at the rates um, over time compared to the previous National Drug Strategy Household Surveys, you see that the rate of methamphetamine use is actually decreasing. Um, but it is hard to measure methamphetamine use in populations and many communities often report higher rates um, than are reflected in these surveys. It's also important to realise that internationally Australia has one of the highest rates of illicit methamphetamine use. So although according to the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, the rate of methamphetamine use is decreasing, um, what we are seeing among people who are using methamphetamine is an increase in the type of, in increase in crystal methamphetamine being the preferred type. So in the National Drug Strategy Household Survey in 2010, 22% reported using crystal methamphetamine as their main form. This increased to 50% in 2013 and then to 57% in 2016. 
Um, we're also seeing an increase in methamphetamine related harms. And these have been shown by um, increased phone line calls, hospital admissions, uh, treatment episodes for dependents, and also drug related deaths. Um, we also know that the effects of crystal methamphetamine can stretch far beyond just the person who uses the drug, and it impacts families, friends, communities, and workplaces. For family and friends of people who use ice, there's a lot of worry and psychological distress, and sometimes people end up neglecting their own needs for sleep and nutrition and social activities because they're devoting so much time to caring for a loved one. Now, methamphetamine is something that is of a concern to the community. So in the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, 40% of those surveyed rated methamphetamine as the drug of most concern in Australia. And this overtook excessive drinking of alcohol for the first time in the survey's history. So although methamphetamine might not be as commonly used as other drugs, it's obviously something that people are worried about. So in response to the growing concern, uh, the Australian government established the National Ice Task Force in 2015. And this was to provide advice on the impacts of ice in Australia and the actions needed to address use related harms. So a key recommendation from the task force was to develop an online toolkit to provide information and resources to families and communities affected by ice. And it was off the back of that specific recommendation that Cracks in the Ice was developed. So Cracks in the Ice uh, was developed over a two year period with funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. And it was informed with the input of over 500 community members as well as experts and researchers from uh, universities and research centres across Australia. We also had several uh, stages of development guided by uh, external collaborators, Mr Jack Nagel and Miss Jenny Valentish, who were people with lived experience and could bring their own unique perspective to the project. Um, so Cracks in the Ice, as I mentioned, is a national online toolkit and it aims to provide trusted, evidence-based and up-to-date information and resources but we also have a mobile app. And the mobile app was designed um, so that it could be downloaded and it's functional even when offline. And we really tailored it um, for mobile users and that way people who don't always have reliable internet connection like those in rural and remote areas can still access the resources and information on the toolkit. Um, and then the next time they connect to the internet, they can get any updates that they need. And we thought this was particularly important as um, there are several data sources that show that regional and remote areas, uh, the rates of methamphetamine use are often twice as high compared to metropolitan areas. So just quickly, this is the homepage for Cracks on the Ice. I will come back to it a bit later, so don't feel that you have to digest everything instantly. Um, but you just briefly, you can see that it covers a wide range of topics. Um, and we also have targeted landing pages for family and friends, health professionals and the community. Um, so just a little bit more about cracks in the ice. I'm sure you're all finding this very exciting. Um, since the launch in 2017, we've reached over 400,000 uh, unique end users and we've also had 800,000 uh, page reviews. We've also distributed um, 160,000 hard copy resources across the country, which is amazing. And we've also done a collaboration with SBS um, to create some video resources um, to accompany their series on Struggle Street. And these were created to help bust some of those myths around methamphetamine, like it's impossible to break ice dependence. Um, when we look at how many people and what they're looking at on the site, we see that people are coming to answer those basic questions. What it is, what are its effects mentally and physically, how many people are using it, and why do people use ice? Interestingly, we also get a lot of people uh, looking at what are the laws about ice. Um, but one of our top visited pages is what type of help is available. And we found this particularly interesting as researchers because we know that their effective treatments exist however uh, many people aren't getting the help they need when they need it and 
People who use methamphetamine or have methamphetamine dependence often wait many years before seeking help. And there are um, many reasons for this. Um, according to the research, the range of things include practical barriers, such as service availability, long waiting lists, the cost of the treatment or having to take time off work, as well as the psychosocial reasons, thinking that they can manage themselves, they don't need treatment, but also um, stigma and fear of embarrassment. When um, we look at what barriers are the most common, we do have a meta-analysis um, in this space that examined 11 studies internationally, and they found that stigma and fear of embarrassment is one of the top barriers cited in the literature. So what exactly is stigma? Well, like many other terms from social science literature, uh, it has been defined in different ways, but for today's purposes, I'm going to uh, refer to it as a mark of disgrace that's applied to someone because of something about them that's viewed negatively by others. So in this case, that mark of disgrace is their use of drugs. And this mark of disgrace often overshadows that whole unique person so that they are only seen by that single characteristic and no longer as anything else. Now, there is such a thing as self-stigma, and that when, is when people of, um, who have been stigmatised against come to internalise those negative views of themselves that they see in mainstream culture, and thereby develop a negative self-concept and often feel ashamed of themselves. Now, discrimination is something that goes hand in hand with stigma, and that refers to the unfair treatment of someone based on that personal characteristic. And it's essentially the behavioural outcome of stigma. Now, we know that there's quite a lot of stigma attached to drug use, so much so that dependence on illegal drugs such as methamphetamine has been classified by the World Health Organisation as the most stigmatised health condition in the world. And it's important to realise that the impacts of this stigma are wide reaching. Not only is it a barrier to treatment, but it's also a barrier to other services, including a healthcare, welfare, uh, support services and workplaces. And it can also cause profound uh, psychological stress, making people feel ashamed, worthless and depressed. But also it can impact their family and friends. And they might experience judgment and discrimination by association. Lastly, stigma and the negative feelings associated with it um, can also trigger further drug use as a way of coping with that distress and isolation. So when we look uh, at Australia in particular, we see there is preliminary evidence of ice attracting a high level of stigma. Um, and it's often commonly portrayed in a negative light. And as we saw earlier, it's attracting a lot of uh, community concern. Now, there hasn't been a lot of research into this. Um, so there have been a few qualitative studies, but they've looked at small samples, um, usually in limited areas, and they don't really assess public attitudes, which is often, of course, where stigma originates. So this um, led us to conduct some recent research as part of the Cracks in the Ice program. Um, so in 2019, and it's scary to think that that was last year, uh, the Cracks in the Ice project ran an online survey when we really wanted to find out the usefulness and impact of the Cracks in the Ice website um, by having an online survey that was open to all Australian residents aged 18 years and over. Um, and it was an online anonymous survey which was open to both people who had used ice and hadn't used it before. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to really investigate stigma, discrimination and barriers to care. So we decided to include some questions at the start of the uh, online survey and these questions covered uh, people's attitudes towards people who use ice, any personal instances of barriers to care and uh, discrimination and we also had a knowledge quiz that aimed to identify any misconceptions about ice that could be driving uh, fear and stigma. So we had uh, 2,110 people complete the survey, and these included people who had and hadn't visited the site, 
Now, this very large number of people who hadn't visited the site was actually because of a extremely successful Facebook advertising campaign. So if you are doing any research in this area, I recommend Facebook advertising as a way to recruit people. Um, we also made sure to collect responses from people who use ICE, but also their family and friends and health professionals. So uh, generally the participants were female, so it was 59% female. Um, they were generally aged between 18 and 40, and most of the participants came from the Eastern Seaboard, so Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Um, and there was a majority of people in metro areas, so 56%, but there was some coverage of regional and in 33% and 11% in remote areas. So many participants had also been affected by ice in, in some way. So there was 27% reported having used ice before and 41% reported having a family or friend who they thought might be using ice. So we found that stigmatising attitudes were prevalent among people who had not used ice before. So these people were asked whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement um, based on a Likert scale. And so what you're seeing here is the number of people who strongly agreed or agreed with the statement. So there were 71% who agreed that they would not associate with people who use ice if they could help it. 62% agreed that the use of ice is just plain wrong. 50% agreed that people who use ice are dangerous. 36% agreed with the statement that a person could um, recover if they just stopped using ice. Um, and scarily, 16% of people agreed with the statement that people who use ice should be locked up to protect society. There was also 31% of people who agreed with the statement that if they had a problem with ice, they would not tell anyone. So there were 565 people who reported previous use of ice um, and discrimination was common. There was 39% of those who had used ice reg before reporting some form of discrimination and this rose to 70% among people who use ice regularly, which we defined as at least once a month or more. And these are just a couple of the personal stories that people uh, gave us in the survey. So this lady at 42 years old said, no one in my close circle knew of my ice use. We also had a male at 32 years say, hardly anyone knows I had an ice addiction, only my close family only my close friends, but not my family, due to the risk of negative perception. And there was a female who was 24 years old who said, I don't tell anyone that I'm an addict until they've gained my trust. Newcomers think that I'm just a crackhead and going to do stereotypical things like steal or have sex for drugs. Stigma was also prevalent among people who had used ice before. So among people who reported previous use of ice, 53% agreed with the statement a person could recover if they just stopped using. 51% agreed that they would associate with people, uh, won't associate with people who use ice if they could help it. 38% said if I had a problem with ice I won't tell anyone. 30% um, said use of ice is just plain wrong and 23% people who use ice are dangerous. And so this is a sign that some of these people have adopted perhaps that self stigma and they're adopting what they see in the media and those negative perceptions and putting them, internalizing them. We also asked um, people who reported using ice before about the barriers to care. And so these are shown in, level, um, in order of endorsement. And so we had Barriers that covered both attitudinal things, knowledge and structural, um, but most commonly stigma was the key barrier. So there were 25% of people who reported that they hadn't sought help in the past because they were afraid of what others would think of them. And 21% reported more generally that they were afraid to seek help. The only barriers more commonly cited than these were that people preferred to manage themselves or not believing that they needed help in the first place. Um, it's also important to note that some of those knowledge barriers, I didn't think anything could help, I don't know where to seek help, 
could also reflect some structural things about not um, having enough services available. We also asked participants who reported previous ICE use um, about the availability of services, public and private, that provide support in their local area. And we found that this was a big issue for people. So 40% of those who had used ICE before rated the availability of public and private services as either poor or extremely poor. And then when we break down the results by region into metropolitan in grey, regional in light orange and rural in dark orange, we found that service availability ratings were significantly worse in regional, rural, remote areas versus metropolitan areas. And this is not unsurprising as a recent report by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare stated that in general for treatment of alcohol and other drugs, clients will travel um, up to one hour or longer to access services compared to those in metropolitan or major cities. So this highlights the need for better investment in services, service providers, as well as some innovation. Now, given that stigma is one of the biggest barriers, um, how do we tackle it? Well, luckily there are a few ways that we can do that and we can encourage other people to as well. And first off, is to encourage people to get the facts and always look for evidence-based information. So this is uh, the Cracks in the Ice website and this is a great place to start. Um, so you can have a look at this homepage here. So we've got some scrolling banners of quotes. We've got the three content sections, get the facts, what are the effects, staying safe. And there's a wealth of information under each of those. We also have a link to the SBS video, The Truth About Ice. Um, and then finally, you can test your knowledge with this icebreaker quiz, um, which is not only a great way to engage people, but bust some of those myths about methamphetamine isn't the most commonly used drug. Not all teenagers have used ice. Some of those things that people get reinforced. Um, on the right hand side, we also have an order button for some hard copy resources, the drop down menu for targeted um, resources for the community, family and friends, schools and health professionals. We have a new development which I'm going to keep hidden from you until the last, um, as well as links to our webinars and our fact sheets. So as I mentioned, there are hard copy resources um, available and these include a booklet and a flyer which were developed as companions to the online app, online toolkit. Um, and the booklet aims to summarise key information and promote the resources. So it has a lot of great information for family and friends, health professionals and the general community. Um, best of all, they can be downloaded at any time and it can also be ordered and delivered anywhere in Australia free of charge. So as I promised, um, I will now show you the health professional section in a bit detail. So here is the landing page. And we've organised the resources for health professionals into six sections. So we've got some training and online resources, uh, which provides link to several training and information modules, specifically on crystal methamphetamine. We also have the quick tips section, which are the do's and don'ts for client management. Um, we also have guidelines for a number of groups of health professionals, including nurses, police, emergency workers. Um, as well as some guides on inclusive practice and tips for engaging with diverse audiences. Um, we also do link out and provide information on the specialist telephone um, AOD services that exist. And there's the one that is for uh, Queensland listed on there, which is the Alcohol and Drug Clinical Advisory Service, and that's available seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, and then we also link out to some resources about worker wellbeing. Um, so these is just a super quick snapshot of some of the training and online resource page, including some of the meth check um, resources which were developed by Insight. Thank you, Insight. Um, and we also have uh, just the guideline page there as well. Now I wanted to really highlight one of the training options that are available through Cracks in the Ice is the comorbidity guidelines. So these were also developed by the Matilda Centre 
Um, and I'm sure you're all aware that co-occurring mental health and AOD conditions are common in Australia. Um, and so these guidelines and the accompanying online training uh, can assist with the management of co-occurring AOD and mental health conditions. And this is particularly important in the context of methamphetamine, as we do see some of those mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, psychosis come uh, up, particularly if they use ICE regularly. There's also the ICE Help website, which is an initiative from the Queensland Government, and that contains some great resources and personal stories. So in other ways that we can challenge uh, stigma, um, we can encourage people to think about um, the specific words that can have stigmatising effects on people who use or have used drugs. And while stigma is m about more than just language, this is a really good place to start. By using language that focuses on the person rather than their use of alcohol uh, and other drugs, and by choosing words that are inclusive and non-judgmental, we can really reduce the impact of stigma. So there are two resources here. There's the ADF Power of Words, uh, which is available online. There's also the one page guide called Language Matters, which was produced by uh, two organisations in New South Wales, so NADA and NUA. And both of these guides were developed in collaboration with people with lived experience. So another way is to take a strength-based and empowering approach which focus on identifying the strengths within the individual, their networks and community. And it's also really important to value the voice of people with lived experience and incorporate them where possible in either research or in practice, um, for example, through peer work, uh, as they do bring a really unique and valuable perspective. You can always uh, encourage those who may be experiencing difficulties with their use to seek support and remind them that there is no shame in seeking help. It's important um, to realise that they, for them to also realise that it's never too early to get help. Um, you could also think about connecting people uh, with one another in a way that they feel comfortable with, their family, community and culture. As, um, connection has been shown to help reduce use and encourage people to start their journey to recovery. Now, I've mentioned families a few times now, um, and it's really important to support families as well, because as I said, um, they also, not always, which is what is written on the slide, that was just to see if you were paying attention, um, they also experience stigma. So we do have a couple of um, great resources in Australia. We've got the Family Drug Support. Um, we also have the Family and Friends Support Program. And both of these and um, their contact details are available through Cracks in the Ice. Now, the Family Friends Support Program, um, that is an online intervention and support package. And it recognises that supporting a person who uses ice can be extremely stressful. And it aims to assist family and friends to better manage the demands of that role. Um, it's also important to note that Stigmatising views may have been shaped or reinforced by some Australian news media. Um, and they may report sensationalist stories that exaggerate the prevalence and impacts of ICE. So, you know, it's really good to can think about those articles critically. Um, we've also seen some public health campaigns in Australia over recent years that may have inadvertently perpetuated the negative stereotypes about people who use ice. Um, so there are a couple of research papers um, on this. So if you're interested, you can read a detailed analysis of the media sentiment around uh, ice in Australia, published by Cone. Um, and you can also read about the evaluation of the impacts of the latest public health campaign called Ice Destroyers Lives by Douglas and colleagues. So the Cracks in the Ice team recently worked with another organisation called Mindframe to develop a set of media guidelines specifically about crystal methamphetamine. And so Mindframe specialises in consulting the media on how to report safely and responsibly on stories related to substance use and mental health issues. So we co-developed these guidelines to support any media professionals who are looking for guidance in this space. Um, 
And there are media outlets that are doing a great job um, and reporting in an informative and respectful way, but we could always do better. So um, just in like to summarize some of the main points from today. So there is a high level of public stigma that's surrounding um, the use of ice in Australia. And many people who use ice are discriminated against for their use and often put off seeking help for fear of being judged. So it's really important that we find ways to tackle that discrimination and stigma and really encourage people to seek help. Now, Cracks in the Ice is a site which can provide the evidence-based information um, about crystal methamphetamine in a non-judgmental way. And it also has a lot of links and support for anyone who's been affected by ICE, including families, communities, and health professionals. So I'm now gonna unveil my secret tile um, on the homepage. So we're currently working on an adaption of Cracks in the Ice, specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So in 2017 and 2018, we conducted community consultations in six sites across Australia. And the sites for the consultations were selected to cover metropolitan cities, uh, rural regional towns, and regional towns servicing remote Australian communities across Australia. Now within each of these six sites, local Aboriginal or Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations supported the project and recruited local participants. So the purpose of these community consultations was to identify the most important questions Aboriginal people had about uh, crystal methamphetamine and its harms and how an adaption of the toolkit could address those questions. So we're now um, building upon that extensive consultation and combined with the evidence-based information and existing resources that we've found to develop uh, an online portal, which we hope to launch later this year. Um, but at the moment, we have the temporary landing page, which you can see on the right of the slide, with a few animations and some background details. So if this is an area that's of interest to you, I'd encourage you to take a look and maybe even suggest some content that we could look at. So to finish up, I'd uh, like to acknowledge the Australian Government Department of Health as our funding source. I'd also like to acknowledge the wider Cracks in the Ice team, um, as well as our collaborators and consultants. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the many community members who have provided input during the development of Cracks in the Ice, and also thank the individuals who so generously shared their experiences with us and allowed um, us to share their stories on the site. So thank you all for listening. If you would like to get in touch, you can uh, do that in a number of ways, visiting the website, um, contacting us through our email address or following us on social media. Um, thank you. Thank you, Steph. I appreciate that very much indeed. Um, and it's exciting to see some of the future changes that are coming in the cracks in the ice app. I know as a clinician, it's something that I encourage clients to access very frequently and myself have had good feedback from them about it. So thank you for, for that. Have we got any questions in the room? No, I'm getting silence and we have nothing online. Um, I guess I have uh, a question I'd ask ask is um, something that we get asked on a regular basis that 1.4 percent that was in 2016 and obviously when you are working with clinicians that are you know in ed facilities or in you know acute mental health services they kind of struggle to get their heads around the fact that it is as little as 1.4 percent do you think because we're likely to get the new household survey coming out soon do you think that number would have continued to come down in your experience it's hard to know um, because it is a self-report story and they also uh, only collect data from private houses so they don't look at uh, homeless people or hospitals or any of the other areas where people who use drugs might be more likely to be um, and also people think that it's okay to report their cannabis use but not their crystal methamphetamine use so it's always hard to really gauge exactly what the prevalence of illegal drugs is um, 
I have a suspicion that it will go up, but not a lot. That kind of goes with what I would expect as well. The other question I have is regarding the guidelines that you are putting together for media around mm -hmm. coverage of um, you know, ICE use, for want of a better, better word. Um, I'm guessing that's a voluntary thing for media if they want to you know, promote something in a different format, that they would come and access that to see how they might be able to do that. Is that correct? It's not something yes, that's... Yes, it is voluntary, right? yes. Um, but it is something that we heavily promote and um, distribute through media channels. I have two other questions. One is online, so I should just quickly read you that. How do you track social... Oh, sorry, that's something that popped up on the screen. <laughs> My IT guy is dealing with it as we speak. So I'll ask the one I was going to ask oh, while okay. he plays with his computer. Um, regarding the... You say that you can order a hardback copy of yes. Cracks in the Ice, or you, you know, and there's obviously the app. What's the difference between the two? Is it, you know, if I use the app, is it worth me ordering a hardback copy as well? Or do you know what I mean? Yes, uh, I guess it really depends on your situation. Um, if you are looking for something um, to distribute or you find reading paper easier on your eyes, then I would definitely say order the booklet. Um, but yeah, all the same key information is available on the app and also the app gets updated more regularly. So I guess it's about how you would really use that information. Right, the question I got online was, how do you track social users and users who use this drug as a party drug? Do you track? I don't track them in my research. Um, part of the evaluation study, we did ask about obviously how often they were using it and that can kind of guide somewhat of the, whether it's a recreational use or more of a continual use. Um, but it is something that's hard to do. Yeah, I agree. I think it's certainly uh, methamphetamine seems to be a drug that's used uh, in the chemsex scene, for yes. want of a better word. But it's very difficult to separate the people that are using it recreationally in that format as opposed to the people that we have coming through our door on a more dependent use of that. I think, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, and finally, I've got a, a, I think it's one question. Uh, two, I'm being told. I was hoping to get some advice or information of how to engage uh, engagement strategies for individuals who are clearly using methamphetamine but do not identify as users. Um, and it's hard to differentiate between mental health symptoms and the effects of methamphetamine, whether it's intoxication or the company. Any advice on engagement? Um... My advice would be probably to go to the website and check out the resources there. It is really difficult with mental health um, and AOD to figure out which one came first or which one is the result of the other. Um, but the comorbidity guidelines do some excellent training around that and they also provide tips. So I would highly recommend looking at that. I've done that training, I'd also second that. Um, and finally, do you feel it's useful to discuss stigma with the clients? Do you think that can be a motivating thing towards change? Well, that's really tough. Um, yes, I think. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just thinking about the, the many complexities around it. I think it's good to acknowledge that stigma does exist and that they're likely or have been affected. So if they've had discrimination, that's not always how they're going to be treated. Um, but yeah, it's one of those tricky things because some people don't like to talk about their previous experiences. So I guess it would really depend on the client, your relationship with them and how comfortable you would gauge that they would be happy to have that conversation with you. But I would probably go for honesty. I, I agree. And I think you, know, you, you brought it up today in your presentation, but I think something that's kind of uh, not uh, recognised as much as perhaps it should be is the self stigma that people carry. Yeah. And I certainly, uh, obviously, you know, it's on a case by case basis, as you say, but I think it's kind of important to get the person to understand how they look at themselves and why they might possibly do yeah. that and whether it is actually a reality or if it's a projection of other things. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Any further questions? No, in which case, can we thank Dr. Steph Kershaw again for her presentation today?